Welcome. Let me say something about primes in the complex plane or in the quaternions. It's something I've worked on in 2016, close to topics which are score, score high in crackpot indices like John Baez or Trace Caldwell. But it's uh, mathematics, beautiful mathematics here about complex primes in the complex plane. The Gaussian primes. One can think about them as fermions. I like the analogy because it allows you to remember theorems like the quadratic reciprocity theorem can be understood quite well with this. You look whether P is a quadratic residue modulo Q or Q is a quadratic residue modulo P and now you can just uh, distinguish two type of primes, primes of the form for k plus one, which decay. They decay in the complex plane into two fermions, the two conjugate primes. This is related to the Fermat's two square theorem, the Christmas theorem of Fermat, which he found around Christmas time. And uh, then there are the primes uh, of the form for k plus three. So if you have a for k plus one, that decays into two particles and uh, so it's a product of two particles. You can think about that as a boson and the other primes of the form 4k plus 3 you can think about as fermions. So I once kind of dubbed the ones which are of the form 4k plus 3 as neutrinis and uh, the electron positron pairs here. So these are the primes of the form 4k plus 1. They decay. <coughs> So that's kind of a, one of the things. It's an old uh, theorem, has lots of proofs, this uh, quadratic reciprocity theorem. This is a division algebra, a commutative complete division algebra C, and uh, we can also look at the division algebra of the quaternions, which is the unique non-commutative associative real division algebra. and. Uh, Horvitz has, uh, Adolf Horvitz has in 1919, he has published, as just when he died, published uh, lecture notes on quaternion primes. And uh, he actually did the work earlier on in 1896. And he defined, first of all, what integers are in the quaternions. It's not just the integer, you know, the integer. Uh, vectors. It's not that lattice, it's not the maximal order, so he saw that there are two max, two orders, two modules you can define, and uh, what, which are integral to. And uh, so I like to distinguish then the quaternion integers into two, so there are the Lipschitz integers which have just integer entries, and then the Hurwitz integers which have half integer entries. So then you could look at the primes. Primes are numbers which cannot be decomposed into smaller ones and which are not units. So there is this uh, norm which is the square of the, you know, the length and this is uh, multiplicative as Euler already knew, this four square identity and then you can look at the quaternion primes, they are just the integers which you cannot factor anymore. Horvitz showed that these are just characterized by all the integers which have norm a uh, prime. Of course, if it has a norm prime, it cannot be factored by this identity, but it's the, the other way also. So every prime has this form, and uh, it's then also, uh, there are infinitely many of both types because of explicit formulas for the number of primes, which you can give of fn. When, you, when n is given, there is a how many times can you write the number n as a sum of four primes? So this is, uh, uh, Jacobi has done that using the identity. This is the framework where you want to understand these primes. And uh, if you look at this uh, particle allegory 
in the complex plane, it's natural to ask, is there a particle analogy here? And yes, there is. So you have, first of all, you have groups acting on the integers. There's the group of units, which are the 24 units. These are, this is the a binary tetrahedral group, 2T, it's usually called. And uh, so these are uh, it's represented by this uh, 24 cell. So 24 vertices, each vertex is an element in this group, a yeah. uh, unit. But then there is another group acting on the integers, which is given by permutations and uh, sign flips. So every integer now you can kind of, you can first of all permute so that it's ordered and you can also make all the entries positive and so you have representatives in equivalent, in these equivalence classes. And uh, I actually uh, like to think about the integers modulo this group here as quarks. We will see why. So there are uh, quarks because one can now look at the equivalence classes when you let act the second group U on this equivalence classes. It's the equivalence class of equivalence classes, and you what what happens is there are just two possibilities. Either you have a pair of quarks, or so the mesons, or you have a triplet of quarks. These are the Baryons together, I mean, baryons or mesons together are hadrons. So there is a kind of a nice structure. It's purely combinatorial. There is actually no physics involved at all, but it's kind of nice that we see this, uh, this uh, particle structures in this non curative setting. And uh, what happens also, you can, uh, I play with this a little bit later than in 2016 and uh, assign charges. So you can also char assign charges so that uh, then these uh, the baryons or mesons have integer charge and so the quarks themselves have then charges uh, which are thirds. Now you can ask is this real? Does this really have relations with physics? I'm a mathematician and you see quark structures also in the uh, Rubik cube, for example, this is a this is a meson because it has a quark anti quark configuration, and you cannot realize a quark alone here in this group. So, uh, yeah, just so some conservation laws which prevent you to have just to turn one of the corners, and you have also you have mesons. You have all, you can turn three of them. That's kind of a baryon structure. So you can also in the Rubik cube or finitely presented groups you can find such. Uh, structures, but that's what I wanted to say today. <clears throat>